What I like about stars is, is the fact that we, we can study them in detail and we can apply physics to the study of stars and the study of exoplanets. In a sense, we can use the stars as laboratories for physics under very extreme conditions that we can't meet in, in, the, in the terrestrial laboratory. And the reason we can do that is that we can make very detailed observations of the internal properties of the stars. And that's really the, the field of research that I've been working on for my, my whole career. The fact that we can see waves on the stellar surfaces, just like we see waves in, in the Earth. And just like for the Earth, we can use those waves to do seismology of the interiors of the stars. So we can measure what conditions are inside the Sun in, in very great detail, in, in what we call helioseismology, and, and we can do similar things uh, in less detail for our stars. Well, helioseismology, it's the study of the uh, motions of the gas and how the waves that propagate through the sun uh, can tell us about the properties of the materials they're, they're passing through. So the, initially it was a matter of looking at the frequencies of the solar, the sun oscillating and trying to compare those frequencies with what models predict and trying to adjust the models so that they predicted the right frequencies. In addition, the gas in the sun drags the waves with it. If the gas in the sun and the wave are going in the same direction, then it tends to stretch out the wave in the direction that it's going. And if it's going in the opposite direction, it tends, it will compress the wavelengths. So you'll see them more uh, with a shorter wavelength. And so by comparing the mode frequencies of waves going in these opposite directions, you can determine how fast the gas is moving that's carrying the waves with it. And so by using this technique and fairly generalized ways, people are now able to deduce a great deal about how the sun is moving in its interior. Because it's all gas, it doesn't have to move at the same rate, and so we can determine how the dynamical structure of the sun is actually configured. The sun's mass is higher than about 10 times the solar mass behave rather differently from the, uh, the Sun. First of all, they're much brighter, uh, and, and so even though they're more massive, they evolve faster, and they live for maybe 100 million years or less. And secondly, when they have used up all their fuel, and that happens through a number of nuclear reactions uh, in, in the Sun, we think that the nuclear reactions uh, at the moment convert hydrogen into helium. Then as the Sun grows old, the nuclear reactions can continue in the core of the sun, so helium can fuse into carbon and oxygen. But that's as, as far as it goes in a star like the sun. In these more massive stars, uh, this fusion of element into heavier and heavier elements continue up to production of iron. And then the fusion processes stop, and uh, eventually the core of the star collapses, re uh, releasing a huge amount of energy uh, in what we call a supernova explosion. And in, in that process, the, all the nuclear elements that have been produced in the core of the star is spread in the interstellar space and then might be used in the formation of new stars and new planets. And so what we believe has happened is that in the original universe uh, created in, in the Big Bang, there was only hydrogen and helium and very small amounts of other elements. Here uh, in Leuven, let's say, we study uh, massive stars. So these are born with more uh, mass than the sun, and they live uh, quite a different life than the sun. And so the, the most important thing that we discovered, let's say, the past uh, two decades, you could say, is how stars rotate in their interior. Huh? So the gaseous layers, they rotate around uh, the central core, and uh, we have been able to measure that rotation 
which is quite different from the surface rotation. Huh? You only see the surface of the star, but thanks to the stellar oscillations, we can understand how they rotate in their interior. And so we are mapping that out now, thanks to the space missions that give us sufficient data to unravel that for many stars. But now in the future is the next stage, because once you know how a star rotates in its interior, you also can get a better handle on how the chemicals mix inside the star. And so chemical mixing, as we call it, is really determining how the stars live their life in a much better way than when you don't know anything about this chemical mixing. And so our next step is to use the information and the knowledge on the stellar rotation that we have gained the past few years and to try to use that to exploit in more detail the properties of the stellar oscillations and uh, to derive uh, the mixing properties of the chemistry of the star. The more materials mix, uh, the longer the nuclear fusion can keep going inside the star. So this is really the crucial thing if you want to get good stellar ages. And stellar ages, of course, they determine how long the stars live. And when a star dies, it gives away its, en its, its energy very violently in, in the stars that we are studying. But it also gives its chemicals that it created during its life back to the galaxy. And that then makes new stars. And so they get richer and richer in metals. Now, if you think of that as human beings, like we are here thanks to a lot of metals that we have here on our planet and also oxygen and nitrogen, uh, etc. So the chemical evolution of the Milky Way is really made thanks to the stars. And so if we understand better how long they need to do that to make these materials and to give them back, then the, the chemistry cycle of the Milky Way uh, will become way better determined. And that is really uh, of, of vital importance if you want to understand how our universe evolves, but also how life on possible exoplanets in our Milky Way would come to be or not. Please welcome on stage Connie Clara Ertz, Jörn Christensen Dalsgård, and Roger Ulrich.